A desperate Ohio couple pleads with a 911 operator. 911, what's going on there? For police help. Well, me and my friend, we've been having some issues with somebody stalking us okay. and menacing us. But the very person threatening their life? So what's going on right now? Well, basically, he's armed and dangerous. He's sitting out in front of the house. Is the same one sworn to protect them? What's his name? Uh, I believe it's Eric. Is her boyfriend the Akron cop? <laughs> yeah. How do you know? Trust, safety, security, basic needs that young single mom Alexis Ducaney was lacking in her life. I don't think Ms. Ducaney had the best childhood and upbringing. I think as a result of some of her experiences, she had post-traumatic stress disorder and some mental health issues that she was dealing with. Then, at the age of 27, she decided to take control of her destiny enrolling at the University of Akron, Ohio, to study, of all things, criminal justice. During your studies at the university, you met a professor. I did. Eric Paul. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, about him as a person. He seemed like a very intelligent, um, great guy, um, a good teacher. Um, I enjoyed the class. Someone that you trusted. Yes. In addition to being an adjunct professor at the university, he was a decorated police sergeant with 20 years of stellar service. He was very celebrated. Uh, he did a lot of work for the department. They depended on him for grant writing. And from outside looking in, he's what any police department would want. And after a while, he was what Alexis thought she wanted too. Of course, at the time, he was her professor and a married man. The two became good friends, and some time after Alexis completed his class, they became even more. Everything just came really naturally. He was helpful with college things, different things I needed or had questions about in school, and I just felt safe at, at first with him. He decides that he's going to get a divorce, right? right. He has been with his wife since he was 18 years old. Correct. He has two daughters, he's leaving his wife. Why? Because he loves you so much? He said that I was the only woman he'd ever loved, ever. And did you believe him? Yeah, I did. In Eric, Alexis felt like she'd finally found the safety and stability she'd been craving. But Sergeant Eric Paul was hiding some dark secrets, the kind that escaped from the bottom of a bottle. And how often was he drinking? Daily, eventually I realized it was daily. He was a very functional alcoholic. He, we had text messages between us where he would say, you know, in my career, I'm rock solid. And no one knows who I really am. Before long, the once caring cop started exerting more and more control over his girlfriend's life. He wanted to know all of my vulnerabilities. He wanted to know everything, everything about my past, everything I was doing every day. He would text me between, I guess the average was two and 500 times a day. Two and 500 times a day. Yeah. What else could he have been doing during that time? And things only got more disturbing from there. Our relationship was um, very up and down. It would be really great, and then he would get heavily intoxicated and then would maybe threaten to end my life or his own. I would say almost weekly at one point, he would told me if I tried to leave him, he was gonna kill himself. Alexis felt trapped, but then out of nowhere, Eric left her. I was relieved when he ended it. And you didn't feel sadness at the time? Maybe a or... little, but I think that my gut told me, you know, this is a good thing, this is a good thing. It had been, what, two years? About a year and a half. A year and a half at, at that, that point. point. A year and a half of extreme dysfunction. Both Alexis and Eric seemed eager to move on. Eric began seeing someone else. And while Alexis wasn't so quick to trust again, she did eventually allow another man in. Um, September of 2014, I finally, um, I had met someone through church and we kind of began casually dating. And, you know, I... Did you tell him? Well, I got up the courage. Um, I texted him one day. When he texted me one day, I said, Eric, it's not appropriate anymore that you messaged me. I met someone. And he was not happy. About 2 a.m. that night, I wake up to what sounds like someone trying to smash in my bedroom window. It was him. He had ripped the screen out of my bedroom window and was trying to break in. And that's when most people would have called the police. But Eric Paul was the police. What happened after that? 
he was texting me saying, I will not leave until you come out. I can wait here all night. And um, so I went outside and he puts the gun to my head. And So he put the gun to your head that night? Yes. Did you think that you were going to die? Mm. Everything inside of Alexis screamed, run away. But mortal fear can be a powerful motivator. He pointed the gun at himself and said, I can't live without you. You're the only woman I love. I need you. I broke up with my girlfriend today. I want to be with you. Staring at the barrel of Eric's service weapon, Alexis felt she had no choice but to tell him they could work things out, anything to get him to leave. But for the bad cop, there was still the matter of the other man she was dating. The next following day, he called me and he said that he had ran the background report on the guy. And he said, I will kill him and I will kill you. You need to stop talking to him. And uh, so I did. But if she thought that would make things better between her and Eric, she was dead wrong. Thanksgiving 2014, mm -hmm. what happens on that day? The day started out okay. Uh, we went to our, my family house and he went to his family's house. And um, You're still together at this point? Yeah, we're still together. Um, and I get a phone call and he's like, hey, you know, I want to come over and watch a movie or hang out. I said, okay. So I put my son to bed, and when he arrived, I realized he was pretty heavily intoxicated. Alexis feels uneasy, but doesn't want to do anything to set him off. After the movie was over, we were laying there, and uh, he, uh, he just started getting really violent, um, verbally aggressive, shouting, yelling, um, to an extreme that I had never seen. Um, and I, I was immediately very, very, very afraid and she had every reason to be. He began to get aggressive and yelling and pulling my hair, shoving me, and uh, threw me down um, on the couch and began to put his hands around my neck and began to strangle me. I couldn't breathe. I was grasping at my neck, trying to get his hands off, and I couldn't. And then, with her vision fading, this was the last thing Alexis says she could recall. He flipped me over and um, pulled down my pants and just, you know, started raping me. And um, that's the last thing I remember. And yet somehow, it was just the beginning. To protect and serve, the sworn oath of every police officer. But when it came to his girlfriend, Alexis, Ohio Police Sergeant Eric Paul operated by a different code. Thanksgiving night, in a heavily intoxicated rage, Eric begins to strangle his girlfriend. The last thing she remembers before passing out, she alleges, is being raped by the man she once trusted. When I woke up, I was still face down, and my son was at the bottom of the stairs, crying. And Eric was like, got, got off me and was like, go get your son, bitch. You don't know at this point exactly what your son saw. No. But he was definitely there when you woke up. Mm -hmm. After that, Eric left and Alexis felt helpless, too afraid to call police, also known as Eric's employers. Everything Eric did or said he showed me that he was untouchable. He knew everyone, people he introduced me to. He would tell me he could kill me and get away with it, but all the time. And so Alexis didn't file a report. Instead, she takes her own evidence photos and files them away for future use. The next day, Eric and Alexis have the following text exchange. Eric writes, quote, I've never hurt someone before. I'm actually getting worse. Alexis responds, quote, you crushed my throat. I felt all the pressure behind my eyes and ears ringing. Eric goes on to apologize for the assault, though he never says anything about the rape. What happens after that with your relationship with him? I just try to distance myself as much as possible. I was in that cycle, you know, and I, I thought I could slowly distance myself and he would leave me alone. Looking back, that was definitely not the case. Instead, her life became a living hell. Constant texts, 
messages written in the snow. Eric refused to leave Alexis alone. But then she made a new friend, just a friend, but a good one. Talk to me about how you met Alexis. We had some mutual friends um, on social media. Um, kind of just evolved from there. Like Alexis, Brandon had kids. And for Alexis, it didn't hurt having someone around who could look out for her. But for Eric, Brandon looked like victim number two. Talk to me about the first time you met Eric Paul. What was that like? So my initial contact with Mr. Paul was, wasn't a very good one. After 911, what's location your emergency? Someone's beating on my door. I don't know if they're trying to break in. They're beating on the window. Um, I've got my young children here. Was it the night in December when we were at Alexis's house uh, with our children and he attempted to force his way inside? His two daughters were over. The girls got really scared. They're like, what's going on, Dad? Like, I don't understand. Uh, he's he's there our feet out of the door right now. Okay, so they're trying to actually get in the house now? Yes, yes. I mean, it started getting more fierce and fierce and fierce and going to different windows and the front door, the back door. I was concerned not only for our safety, but our children's safety. Do you have any weapons in the house? No. Okay. Are they still trying to get in? Yep. Okay, go ahead and get the kids up there. And go ahead and shut the door once you guys get in the room. For the next several minutes, Brandon, Alexis, and the kids huddled in the bedroom waiting for police to arrive, even though in a sick way, they were already there. We should have an officer. Do you see an officer? Um. I was upstairs. The police show up and they come inside and Brandon says to them, I know who it was that's trying to get in. And they said, who? And he said, well, it's an Akram police sergeant. And he said their whole look on their face changed. And they said, we need to know who. And he said, Eric Paul. And the, and the sergeant was like, oh, then, instead of taking a report, Alexis says the officer took out his cell phone to call Eric. Come to find out it was a friend of his, ex-partner of his, that was the one that showed up at the residence. Before they even leave my house, began getting threats from Eric. I know what you have done. Alexis tried to get responding officers to take a report, but she says they refused. I said, you know, um, he's gonna kill me. Like, he's crazy, he's lost his mind, he's sick, I need your help. He's like, I'm not making a report, I'll handle this. And they drove off. Abandoned, she felt, by the very agency with any power to do something. And things were only about to get worse. So Brandon leaves and uh, Eric calls me and says, if you don't come to my house right now, I'm gonna come and put a bullet in your son's head and kill you too. So I went. And what happened? I arrived uh, at his house and um, he said that he had taken a bunch of Ativan and he was holding his gun. And he tried to talk to me, you know how much I love you and just all these um, controlling, manipulative statements and I just was appeasing him. I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I'm terrified. Can you see it at that point, how bad things were? Yes, but I, I was just in survival mode. You're in survival mode? At that mode. point I was still in survival mode. After that, Alexis says she tried to keep her distance, making it clear she didn't want to see Eric again, but he didn't stay away. And then April 6th, everything finally came to a head. Concerned for his friend, Brandon told Alexis she could hide out at his house the next town over. So I went and I hid at my friend Brandon's house and uh, pulled into the garage, turned my phone off. I was worried that there was some sort of tracking device on my phone. And so Brandon said, go ahead and use my phone if you want. I get on my Facebook and what I found was completely crazy. He said he was going to every guy's house I'd ever dated. He was taking pictures of himself outside of these guys' houses. He can send me pictures of his gun. You know, he's like, "If you, you can come at any time and I'll stop, but I'm not gonna stop if you don't show up. But Alexis had no intention of leaving the safety of her hideout. Unfortunately, she couldn't stay hidden for long. Finally, he messages me, he says, I figured it out. You took your dog to your mom's house and you're hiding at Brandon's. You coward. Gripped by fear, Alexis feels stuck in a merciless nightmare that just won't end. 
and he's out in front of my house. And you're sure that your dad is home at that address? Yes. It was a nightmare from which she couldn't wake up. Alexis DeCani, brutally raped, she claims, then stalked by the police sergeant she once called her boyfriend. Then, April 6th, Alexis hides out at her friend Brandon's house in a town outside of the sergeant's jurisdiction, just not far enough. He then sends me a picture of himself outside of Brandon's house, like a selfie. And he says, I can see him in there laying on the couch. I can see him. I'm going in. I'm going to shoot him. The person on the couch was actually Brandon's elderly father. Both Alexis and Brandon are out of the house at the time. And Alexis drives straight to the local police department. I demanded to see the supervising, super, like the head next person up. They, they kept telling me no. So finally, I called Brandon. I said, call 911. They mandatorily have to send a cruiser to the address if you call 911. 911, what's your emergency? Well, uh, we've, uh, me and my friend, we've been having some issues with somebody stalking us okay. and menacing us, sending us threatening emails and text messages. Okay, what's going on right now? Well, basically, he's armed and dangerous, and he's sitting out in front of the house. I called 911 from the truck. I didn't know. I, I just didn't want to go home. You know, what am I going to do? Walk walk into a, a gunfight. A gunfight, you know, right. You know, or walk into just be, getting everyone killed. Is her boyfriend the Akron cop? Uh, yeah. Or ex boyfriend, I apologize. How do you know? Okay, she's still here at the police department. So nobody's actually seen this car outside of the house. Nobody's... I don't know. Right now, I'm going by what she's telling me. And my dad's elderly. He's 65, 67 years old basically can find medical equipment. I don't need something going down. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you're sure that your dad is home at that address? Yes. Finally, police do send a cruiser to the scene and find an armed and loaded Eric Paul the next street over. I literally think fell to my knees in relief, and I was like, he'll at least get a, get a DUI. Something. She's drunk. He's wasted, right. if nothing else. And um, they never even did a field sobriety check. Um, they let him go? They pink slipped him. A pink slip means that they have him evaluated by a psych psychiatrist or psychologist. They take him to the psych unit. And what were the results? He was out after a few hours. He was messaging me and threatening me from the psych unit. He still had his phone. Thankfully, Alexis finally gets a judge to issue a temporary protection order. Though getting anyone to enforce it may not be so easy. He pretty much immediately began trying to contact me via email. When I read it and I found it, I immediately called and said, this is what he did. He violated my protection order, you know, and she's like, okay, good to know. How many times did he violate that protection Four. order? Four. Four times? What happened on the fourth time that really got everyone's attention? I text the detective, which had, I got smart and I said, well, if I, if I have a written document that I I'm informing her, I, and I said, this is the fourth time he has violated my protection order. Is it irrelevant? Does it not matter? And what did she say? Nothing, and then he was arrested that day. Brought in by his own brothers in blue. City versus Eric Paul. Why do you think it was so difficult for Alexis to get the proper attention from law enforcement in this case? Because it's so hard to believe. Um, we are trained to respect authority, and we do expect our law enforcement officers to be good people. And when an allegation such as this so outrageous of conduct from an officer surfaces, it is a very hard pill to understand and swallow. But it turns out one of the hardest pills to swallow was still to come. I received a phone call from one of the detectives. I remember she said, I'm gonna need you to sit down for what I'm about to tell you. And she said, there are hundreds of other victims, hundreds. While Crime Watch Daily couldn't verify if the number of victims was actually in the hundreds, there is no doubt that Eric Paul did prey on scores of other women. We really take a deep look into the rabbit hole that we call the mind of Eric Paul here, and you find out how demented and sick he was. Uh, he, he had a penchant for adult and female entertainers. I was informed that he was at a strip club at least five times a week, that he was following other women around, that he was harassing them. He actually went into what's called Oleg, which is a, a gateway that we have in the state of Ohio. 
what it enables them to do is find out basic information. And what we found with him is that on dozens and dozens and dozens of times, he was going in using that for his own, his own purpose, nothing to do with law enforcement. A felony in the state of Ohio. So we charged him and he pled guilty to three separate counts of misusing what we call Oleg, uh, this gateway, and really abusing, abusing the trust that every police officer had. Sugar, I'm so embarrassed. In addition to those charges, Eric Paul pled guilty to one count of menacing by stalking and another for violating a protection order against Alexis. But on the most serious allegation, that brutal Thanksgiving Day rape and strangulation? She never filed any complaints or said anything to anyone about that incident when it originally occurred. I think that ultimately led to that charge being uh, reduced or amended down to an, an aggravated assault. Mr. Paul has always disputed that, that there was any kind of a sexual assault, and I would note that there was never any type of sexual assault charges ever filed against Mr. Paul in connection with this case. The rape was never indicted. So the message that's being sent to her is that it's your fault, somehow, some way, that you were brutally raped. Though the Ohio Attorney General's office asked for the maximum of nine years, Eric Paul was sentenced to four years on six counts, eligible for judicial release in just six months. If he's not released, he will serve the entire four years. But that's cold comfort to Alexis and her team. Stalking and menacing I cannot even begin to express the level of torment I had to experience and endure. The length of the sentence is certainly inadequate for rape. What we would like to see happen is the department take ownership and accept responsibility and say, hey, we have done wrong by you. And we're now going to protect and serve you and try to rebuild and restore trust in you. That is what we would like to see. Though we reached out to Akron police for comment, they have yet to return our calls. However things shake out, Eric Paul will never again be allowed to wear a police match. But for Alexis DeCani, it's a small trade for the pain she's endured. Do you fear for your safety right now? Yeah, yes. Right this minute, even though he's locked up in solitary confinement. So if you fear for your safety now, what happens when he gets out? It's a very um, scary thought. At sentencing, Paul, who is also the father to two teenage girls, apologized to Alexis, his family, and the Akron Police Department.